Hi and welcome to the channel. Today I want once more to try out that exercise with you that I have called Lessons From Applied To and on today's episode I want to bring you these lessons learned from Sequential to try to apply this to another system, the Hydrosynth. The objective of this sound design exercise is really to deep dive into the techniques applied to create patches in one system and ultimately put that clear to the task that whatever techniques you learn from one synthesizer can be applied to another platform. This video will be roughly divided into two parts. The first part where I unpack this patch from the sequential OB6 that I found to be a very iconic patch on what this synth architecture can do. And on the second part I will try to reproduce the same patch with the same sound qualities into the hydrosynth. The whole idea here is that you can take those lessons and apply to your VST or hardware platform as long as you can have similar capabilities there. And if you have a Hydra synth I will show you in detail how to recreate this patch in your Hydra if you wanted to. So without further ado let's get started. There are two main reasons why I have chosen this patch to bring for you today. One of it is because it really showcases a lot what this synthesizer can do. And the second thing, it's also because this patch has some peculiar aspects that are related to how the architecture or the interface in this synthesizer is built. But there is a very interesting aspect to this. This is an analog synthesizer, which is almost knob per function here. You have a few sub menus and a few hidden commands when it comes to calibration and setting up your system. But in general, what you see is what you get. However, you have a thousand memory slots where you can actually save your patches and sound designs mapping to the knobs on the interface. Which also means that the position of the knobs not necessarily represent what you are listening from your saved patch unless you restart the whole system on its default patch. So in order to bring this to you, I actually had to use this interface feature where I have to go knob by knob knob, turning the knobs until this tiny little dot appears here. And this tells me that for the saved patch, this was the default value for that specific knob. And it's not always a straightforward process, but in a way for an analog synthesizer, this is a very neat feature, despite of the knob positioning there, the digital buttons keep their placing. And when a knob has a discrete selection, this will also be saved. So those are easy to map. When I'm trying to understand the qualities of sound of a specific patch, I like to get started with our sound source. This synthesizer has two special oscillators here. I will come into why those are special in a moment. But when we look here at the mixer, we see that there is also a sub oscillator and a noise source. And none of those are playing a role in this sound. Because what we have here is basically oscillator 1 to its full volume and oscillator 2 in about 40% of its volume there. But you will see that that's not the full story. So let's have a look into the different oscillators first. The oscillator 1 in the OB6 has a frequency selector that will give you the scale or the note instead of a normal frequency that you will find in, in classic analog synthesizers. You will also see that oscillator 1 has a, the sync function which is turned off for this patch. But the other peculiar feature in this synthesizer architecture is that the selection for the waveform it's actually a blend or a morph between a sawtooth wave and a square wave for oscillator 1. And my default position for this patch here is more or less at 12 o'clock meaning that this is a waveform 
that is between a sawtooth and a square wave. I wouldn't say that this is a wavetable synthesizer, but the way you select the waveform for oscillator 1 opens up for timber possibilities that you will only find in the wavetable kind of synthesis. Last but not least here, I also have a post width knob that allows me to define the distance between the pulses. So this is not yet modulation, but this is also shaping my waveform, the distance between the pulses. But that will only work for the square wave side of the wave shape here. So you can see already that just by having this specific architecture, we will achieve a very specific timber in oscillator 1. Now let's have a look into oscillator 2. This one has no indication of tuning from the frequency here and my position is around 11 o'clock which gives me a range of about 9 octaves there as well in relation to the main tuning of the instrument. And the detuning here at the position of 12 o'clock means no detuning. But look at this now. That's also very peculiar for this synthesizer that I can actually sacrifice VCO2 turning it into an LFO. And that's exactly what this button is doing. But what is peculiar about it is not to be able to use a VCO as an LFO, but the fact that I can add amplitude for this waveform and listen to it even when it's pulsing below audible frequencies. We talk more about this in a moment when understanding how does this sound into the overall equation. The other difference between VCO2 and VCO1 is that here we have the possibility to morph between three wave shapes, triangle, sawtooth and the square wave. But in this patch oscillator 2 is set all the way to the square wave with a tiny change here about one o'clock on the size of the pulse. Notice as well that oscillator 2 keyboard tracking is turned off meaning that the notes I play on the keyboard will not affect the frequency or pitch of oscillator 2. I think an easier way to listen to what each oscillator is doing as a sound source is to turn off my effects here and play it again for you. Let's listen only to oscillator 1. Now turn the LFO back up. You see that there is not much of a difference there and that's not surprising because the low frequency is below the audible signal. But you will see the interesting effect that this has to actually raise the amplitude of this tone even more when we engage our effects there. But now let's talk about this next ingredient that everyone talks about when referring to the OB6 and that is its filter. The OB6 has a 12 dB per octave or a two pole filter that can be blended between a low pass, a notch and a high pass. And you also have the possibility instead of having a notch there to actually create a band pass filter by engaging this button here on the interface and then this knob will allow you to morph between the low pass, band pass and high pass filters. But there's more to it when it comes to modulation and we will talk about it on that section. What you will have up here is your cutoff frequency as you would expect in a filter and also the resonance. My cutoff frequency is set for about 3 o'clock there and the resonance crank it almost all the way up. The other possibility you have here is to track your filter cutoff frequency to the keyboard either in a half proportion or full, meaning that the higher notes you play the more open the filter will be and you will change the cutoff frequency there. And for this patch we have a full track of the filter. But this is when things start to get interesting. So let's have a look on what's going on in terms of modulation for this patch.
You see that there is a lot of things going on, not only on the stereo spectrum here, the rhythmic aspect of the patch, but also how the sound is being morphed or transformed in an evolving pattern there. Again, if I remove the effects, you have a... We can remove the rhythmic aspect of it. And you can hear all the nuances and transformations here. That is partially achieved by the LFO modulations. So in my LFO here, I have a waveform set to a square wave and my frequency is set to about 10 o'clock. And the range for my LFO here goes from 0 0.022 Hertz up to 500 Hertz. So 10 o'clock will give you what? Something around 180, 200 hertz. And then you will see that I have no sync here and the amount of the LFO modulation is set all the way to its maximum. And the LFO is routed to the pitch of VCO1, the pulse width modulation of VCO2, meaning that it will vary this pulse width knob here in a square wave fashion, but this this is a very specific characteristic of this synth architecture and that is the filter mode and when this button is engaged here what you are actually modulating is this knob here that will change between low pass notch and high pass so again in a square wave fashion the lfo is flipping this knob to morph between those filtering techniques but that's not all Still talking about modulation here, you saw that on this patch we have both the LFO and also VCO2 functioning as an LFO, but another character of this synthesizer sound palette that is not as mentioned as its notch filter is the cross modulation section. And the reason why this is so special, it's because those are modulation destinations that you would normally not find in other platforms. And to be very honest with you, I think these synthesizer push this exercise to the limit because this architecture routing here it's so peculiar and so specific of how Dave Smith and Tom Oberheim thought this instrument to be that I really had a hard time to mimic this in any other platform. And I explain you why. What the XMOD does is that it offers you two potential modulation sources, either your filter envelope, which is a attack, decay, release and sustain envelope, or your VCO2 to be sources of modulation. And this buttons here represents your modulation destination. So again, this is where I can actually route this VCO2 LFO to modulate the pitch of VCO1 as well as my cutoff frequency for my filter and this this one it's a very particular modulation destination only for this synthesizer what this button here is doing is using my vco2 here in a positive value to modulate a morph between the band pass filter that i set here on my filter and the notch filter option the same way by modulating your filter mode here you are spinning this knob smoothly morphing between low pass notch and high pass when we engage the norm to bypass mode here what the modulation does is to morph smoothly between the band pass filter low pass high pass option into low pass notch high pass so there is no button that i could be able to smoothly merge between or morph between those two options here but when engaging the cross modulation section there this is what you get a very smooth transition between those two filter modes and this is very specific of this architecture but okay now we understood what are our sound sources and all of our complex modulation here but one of the main ingredients of this patch it's on its tempo and that's all done here within the effects session so let me engage the effects again so you can hear So you can hear all the rhythmic 
effects that kicks in when you start playing new notes into your polyphony. And depending on how you play, you'll have this echo interplaying with your sound sources, creating all these artifacts. And that is because for this patch, Sequential is using a bucket brigade delay with a very long feedback set to a very interesting proportion between the modulation tempo and the echo feedback tempo there. So that's how you get all this movement in the patch. And on top of that, the hall reverb is also engaged here as effect B with not so generous space since you already have all the delay interaction going on. And last but not least, another element that is vital to this sound is the stereo spread. And this is controlled by the knob pan spread here in my output section. And what this does essentially is that every time I engage a new voice, the more I turn this knob clockwise, the more spread from the center these new voices will take. And if you combine this with a stereo delay effect here, what you get is this random sparks of sound very widespread in your stereo spectrum. And if you combine this with interaction with a filter as you play, You can get not only very interesting effects, I mean this filter sounds amazing, but you get all this rhythmic interplay between what you are playing in real time and the Bucket Brigade feedback echoes. All in all, this is a beautiful sounding patch, very complex, and it amazes me that this is achieved basically with only one sound source. The extensive use of the modulation in this very peculiar architecture of this synthesizer in combination with stereo effects. Very amazing sound, super challenging to decipher, but also to apply into another system. But for me, part of understanding the interplay of all these pieces is to try to recreate this patch from scratch in another platform. So come with me and I'll show you the patch I've created based on this one in the Hydrosynth. And if you have a Hydrosynth, I will show you all the parameters on how to recreate this patch in your Hydrosynth as well. So come with me. Now we are back into known territory here. If you have been following this channel, you know that the OB6 is the new kid on the block. I'm still unpacking and trying to understand all of what that synth can do. Still doing very little sound design on my own and exploring the factory presets there and all of that I can do with the different modules. But the reason why I always fall back into Hydrosynth for this exercise, it's really because that's the lazy man option here with all its five five LFOs, five envelopes, two types of filter, three oscillators. There is a variety of sounds, timbers and synthesis techniques that I can make use in this platform. But like I said, if you make sure that the platform that you are at being a VST or a hardware synth has a compatible capabilities of the synth that you are trying to emulate, you theoretically would be able to reproduce any sound into your platform. But like I said before, I must confess that with the OB6, 
I think we reach the limit here. And that is because of that very peculiar modulation of a normal filter type where you can go beyond low pass notch and high pass filter, morphing with that knob, but also into another filter type, which is the band pass filter morph. And the cross modulation section there allows you to blend not only between low pass notch and high pass or low pass band pass and high pass, but also between the two morphs. And this was something difficult to mimic in this synthesizer architecture that is so much plural that you can make so many things out of it. But if you want to reproduce this patch with me, you will need a patch cable to do our modulation routing workarounds. But I will show you now step by step how to reconstruct this patch. <laughs> I always like to start on the voice menu here. My voice is set to poly mode. Since we are emulating an analog synthesizer, I use analog FL to the value of 73 with a trick we learned here before, turning random face on to mimic the analog synthesizer behavior. And in my voicing, I have actually chosen stereo mode rotate. And what this is doing is simulating the spread pan from the OB6 that I was throwing the different voices into different channels there. And my spread width is exactly what the pan knob was doing there. Again, warm mode on, to get that feeling of the analog into this patch. On page two here, what I did was actually to deactivate the vibrato amount from the mod wheel, just to disconnect that default behavior of the Hydra to do pitch modulation from the mod wheel here, in case we wanted to use for something. <laughs> But okay, that's that for the voice menu. Let's have a look into our sound sources here by jumping into our mixer. And here's where I cheated a little bit because I missed a little bit of low end on my final patch result there. I can tell you a little bit of my process, how I fine tune it as, as we go. But I have used oscillator one as my main sound source, just as the OB6 patch, but I complemented it with oscillator two with a volume of 60.9 there. So oscillator one full volume 128, oscillator two 6.9. No ring, no noise, oscillator two set to zero. So now let's have a look into this first row here. Here in oscillator one, what I have done is to try to emulate the wave shape knob that you have in the OB6. And if you remember, in that synthesizer architecture, you can actually morph between a sawtooth and a square wave. And the way to achieve this in a wavetable synthesizer is to use here the mode set to wave scan. And if we enter my wave list here, you will see that I'm basically using as my first wave a sawtooth and my second wave a square wave and that will mimic the behavior of the OB6. So if I come back here to the oscillator one menu, you will see that my wave scan value is set to 1.7. And what this value is doing is exactly that position, that morphing between the sawtooth and the square wave we had in the OB6. And here is the wave shape. So that's the beauty of the Hydra synth where you can visualize what kind of wave shape morphing you are achieving from your wavetable list there. So now let's have a look into oscillator 2 and what we have here it's a square wave tuned to minus 12 semitones and I detuned it a little bit 6 cents over there still having full keyboard track on this sound source. Those two oscillators here, they are being heavily affected by modulation and the way this is done in the Hydra synth is also through mutants there. I will skip the mutants explanation now just to keep a similar relation to how we explore the OB6 patch. But bear with me that the signal chain will be altered by the mutants here. So more on that on the modulation chapter. But what I want to explore with you now, it's my filter choices. <laughs> You probably 
only have guessed when you saw the architecture on the OB6 that I would be using filter 2 to emulate the filter on the OB6. And the reason for that is because my filter type here can be set to exactly the same architecture as the OB6 for a mode where you have a morph option between low pass notch filter and high pass filter. So this was an easy match for the architecture. My morph value here is set to 38.6, my cutoff frequency to 41.8 and the resonance set to 122. Even more for this patch I will tell you it is important even the fraction values of all parameters because we are talking a lot about fine-tuning harmonics here. You can twist it and tweak it in your own patch but try it out with the exact values for now. Another important parameter that I want to call your attention to in my filter too it's actually the key track and to achieve a similar behavior that we had there in the OB6 I set my key track to 200% instead to try to mimic that full opening of the filter cutoff frequency when you play up into your higher notes in the keyboard. However when I started to play with this configuration that was very similar to the OB6 I still found that my high end was too high and the high frequencies were cutting through to an unpleasant feeling and that is because if you remember in the OB6 you actually had the bandpass filter option engaged so I instinctively went into filter 1 to apply a bandpass filter on top of my morphed low pass notch high pass filter on filter 2 and my option of choice there was the band pass 3 layer and I set my cutoff frequency to 74.1 with a resonance of 42.1 but on the key track here I left the value to only 5% so I'm not altering too much the cutoff frequency of the band pass filter in filter 1 while I'm playing different notes there and another spice that I added here on this secondary filter that is actually connected in series to filter 2 was here on page 2 I added a lot of drive for that filter with a value of 84 so now we have our two sound sources our two filters in parallel let's have a look into the envelope for the amplifier on our signal chain here <laughs> So for the amplifier I'm using an influence of 10.5 of my velocity envelope and I left the amp value to 64 and I'm using here envelope 2 that is pre-routed to the amplifier as my main envelope. I forgot to talk too much about the ADSR envelope in the OB6 but in essence you have a full sustain there and a very long release and that's exactly what I did in envelope 2 here for our amplifier to control the amplitude or the volume of our sound. So basically attack set to 0, decay set to 0, sustain set to 128 full volume and a release of 3.7 seconds. You'll see that a few things here in this patch I set it for absolute time but I'll talk more on that on the next session <laughs> Just to round it off into our signal chain here, I want to show you the effect session the same way as in the OB6. I'm using a delay here and the type of delay is the LRC delay and this is where I started to make use of the patch time to play out with all those rhythmic elements that we saw on the OB6 patch. And the reason for that was to have more control and to synchronize the syncopated effect between between my delay effect and my modulation. So my delay time here was set to half T, feedback of 60.5, a wet tone of 14.2 and I let of course the BPM sync on, that's why we get that proportional time. Also changing the feedback tone to 62.2 and my dry wet set to 68. So a little parenthesis here. The time for this patch was set based on the time of the OB6 patch and that 104 BPM here. And you can set your tempo in the arpeggiator tempo knob and that is the base time that I'm using to calculate my delay and the modulation that we will apply to our sound sources. <laughs> To 
continue on using the same type of effects that we had in the OB6, I've also applied a whole reverb to the signal chain without changing too much the default parameters here with a pre-delay of 0.5 milliseconds, a time set to 480 milliseconds, a tone set to 61.8, high damp at 96, low damp at 0 and a dry wet of 62.5. So this is it on our signal chain here and now I want to deep dive with you into the modulation and the modulation routing. <laughs> So if you remember on the OB6 patch, the sound designer there has set Oscillator 2 as an LFO and they were also making use of the original LFO into the modulation. So the way I mimic here in the Hydra synth was to use LFO 5, I have that tendency to use LFOs from right to left when starting to route the modulation here and this one is simulating my Oscillator 2 that was set as an LFO in the OB6, therefore my waveform is set to square at a rate of 1 to 1 T also sync with the BPM and that's where I'm playing with the delay tempo there as well to get the similar rhythmic effects. I'm using the trig sync to poly but I have phased this wave here a little bit so if I go back you can see that the pulse is in the middle at 99 degrees with a level of 83.9. I will tell you more about the routing of LFO5 when we talk about the mod matrix here. But now let's have a look at our second LFO that is representing the LFO on the OB6 and that's LFO4. Again here I have used a square waveform to simulate the same square wave we had it in the OB6 at a rate of 1 divided by 8 dot. Again I tried to fine tune and out all the artifacts that I was getting between delay and the modulation and of course that is why you have a BPM sync on here. The same trigger sync set to poly and now also I'm playing with a phase of 60 degrees here so you can see that my phasing is offset to the right with a level of 56.8 so I'm also changing the size of the pulse here. Okay that's that for the LFO so now let's see where the magic happens in the mod matrix and all the mutant modulation that we are doing into our sound signal here. <laughs> First I want to jump into a mod matrix and I'll jump a little bit between the menus but I hope you can follow me. If I go to my mod matrix on page 1, what I'm actually doing here, I'm sending the signal on my LFO5 to my control voltage output modulation 1 here and I'm sending this LFO5 signal back into my modulation one input. If you have been following the channel, the reason why I'm doing this, it's because of mutant one. So follow me here. What mutant one is doing is exactly that modulation we saw in the cross modulation on the OB6, where oscillator two that was set to LFO rate in the OB6 was modulating the frequency of oscillator one. However, I cannot put my oscillators in hydrosynth to LFO frequency and I cannot route normally my linear frequency modulation to have it as a source in LFO. So the workaround I found was to actually send my LFO as a control voltage signal and that I can use as a source of my linear frequency modulation here. So that's why the whole workaround to actually be able to make LFO5 modulate the frequency of oscillator 1 here. So mutant 1 set to frequency modulation linear. My source here is modulation mod 1, mod in 1, which is my input for the control voltage there, and I'm physically routing the LFO5 output here and I'm routing from the mod matrix the LFO5 here to the physical output there. The depth is set to 54.4 feedback all the way to 108% and the dry wet set to 61%. <laughs> Let's have a look at the modulations I'm applying to oscillator 2 here. 
So if you remember, oscillator 2 is a workaround I have done to fill in more my low ends in this patch. And this is basically a single wave square wave. So mutant 3, it's that pulse with modulation effect that we got from the cross modulation on the OB6. And the reason why I applied this to oscillator 2 was that I wanted to have that texture of the pulse width without affecting more the pitch of oscillator 1 that is this main sound source. So I kind of splitted the modulation into the two sound sources here. Although in the original patch you have only one sound source, there you have that possibility to actually in the mixer include oscillator 2 set to LFO as an audible source as well. And I think this was what contributed to kind of percussive sound, very low sound that you get in the overall mix. This is what I'm trying to achieve here. So mutant 3 set to pulse with modulation by ASM, ratio of 1, depth of 62.2, feedback set to 0, and the dry wet set to 77%. Now let's jump into the mod matrix and see what I have done in my hydrosynth cross modulation here. <laughs> already showed you my workaround of sending the LFO to the control voltage output there. So this is basically what I'm doing here on my first slot in the mod matrix. Sending LFO 5 as the CV control voltage out number 1 and the value there or the attenuation for that voltage I set to 116.8. My second routing here is to actually route LFO 4 which is mimicking the LFO on the OB6, not the oscillator 2, but the actual LFO from the modulation section to change the pitch slightly of my oscillator 1, the one that is really sounding in audible frequencies. And that set is to pitch 1.5 here. The other thing that I'm mimicking the LFO relation here to the OB6 patch is to control the level of LFO 5. And what this does is actually to change the amplitude of the square wave height. It's also simulating the modulations that were occurring between the LFO in the OB6 and the oscillator 2 and this also gives me kind of a pulse width texture in the overall mix so it was a lot of experimentation and fine-tuning for me. So now let's jump into page 2 two of my mod matrix here and in this slot what I'm doing is sending the modulation from LFO4 to the morph parameter of filter 2. So if you remember the morph parameter is that one that is morphing between low pass, notch and high pass and that's exactly the modulation we get from the patch in the OB6 as well. So this is represented here by LFO4 changing the filter 2 morph parameter to a value of 47 and last but not least I'm using, I'm routing LFO5 to our filter 2 cutoff frequency. So I'm opening and closing the cutoff frequency there at the rate of LFO5. <laughs> Last but not least, I have created a macro for this patch that I want to show you. So let's have a jump into the macro assign page here. And I call this macro tune because the effect of the macro, I was designing it originally to mimic the filter cutoff frequency knob in the OB6. And the reason why I needed a macro for this is because I had to work around that modulation between a bandpass filter and the notch filter smoothly. I don't have that possibility in the hydrosynth. So the best I could do was to do that bandpass filter connected in series to the high pass and I was messing around with the frequencies of, of both of these filters. What I was trying initially to achieve here was to create a more cutoff frequency like button to perform the same way I did in the OB6 but I must confess that I wasn't getting the result I wanted yet. But still I decided to publish this video with you because I was very excited with the result I obtained in the hydrosynth. But what I achieved instead was a tuning effect of the overall harmonics that are generated within this patch and I really like this effect. So it is on my to-do list my next assignment for this patch to create a proper macro that would replace my cutoff frequency in the OB6 so that we can perform by opening and closing the frequencies there. But since I had to work around the filters in parallel for the Hydra I will need some more time to do that. But let's have a look into my tuning macro here 
here and I'll tell you what I'm doing there. My first idea was to actually try to mess around with the filter 1 and filter 2 cutoff frequencies to try to obtain a similar effect that we have when we play around with the OB6 cutoff frequency knob. And the values I set for filter 1 was from bottom value minus 12 to the depth of 12 and on filter 2 which is our notch filter I set the bottom value to minus 20.5 with a depth of 27 and while playing with this I got to very wild results uh, having this resonance feedback and everything that is why I also engaged my macro here to interact with the filter 2 morph type setting the bottom value to 26.2 and the depth to 12.2 so I will show you in a minute what this macro do it's not yet the initial reason why I designed it which was to mimic the cutoff frequency of one single filter but you'll see that I can get very nice results while interacting with this macro so finally let me show you how it sounds <laughs> Setting the differences apart, I think this patch was very successful in capturing the mood of the OB6 and the whole complexity around these interactions with the delay and all these harmonics that are generated as an effect of all the modulations. I think that in the OB6 I get a more pixely sound from all the artifacts that are generated for the delay. And here I got this very interesting metallic sound that sounds a lot like coins falling. And that's exactly what you can tune with a, with a macro. You see that I get almost an octave difference in my percursive sound when I go from 0 to a value of about 20. And you can explore those nuances with a delay feedback there. But another thing that was revealed for me while playing with this patch was actually when using low octaves here. Have a listen. with this result here. Again, the whole purpose of this exercise is not to have a Hydra sounding like an OB6. An OB6 is an OB6, a Hydra is a Hydra, but it's how can we capture the character or the main characteristic of a sound design. And for that sake, again, I think I was successful on showing how you can take lessons from one synthesizer applying to another one. And I'm actually very pleased with how this patch ended up sounding. So if you want, 
you can follow my steps here to have your OB6557 patch into your hydrosynth as well. I hope you have liked this exercise as much as I had. I think I learned a lot on producing this content for you guys. Again, feel free to contribute with your amazing tips. I always learn a lot from your comments as well with suggestions. And please let me know in the comments if you took your time to reproduce this patch in your hydra and we can iterate much more on suggestions on how to improve it and so on. And I leave the challenge there for you as well. How can we build a macro to obtain that same natural filtering effect while using those two filters in parallel. So I let this in the air for the community there. I will try to work it on my version alone but hope to interact with you in the video comments. Thanks so much for watching this video. Thank you for all the subscribers and all the interactions we are having through the channel. And I hope to see you in the next one.